Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail in Howard culture. Today, we got a special guest in the building, a CEO oh. from out of the School of C from Howard. Beauty, music, sports, retail, philanthropy, Nike, H&M, Estee Lauder, YouTube, BeautyCon. This girl is getting it popping. Wow. Soror, Alpha Chapter, got to make that known. Alpha Chapter, Delta Sigma Theta, no shade to any other chapters, right? No shade at all. Founder of League 22, where they create events, curate events, event production and execution, create brand experiences. Man, that's so deep. All the way from L.A., told me she buy coastal though ashley what's up ash hi ashley up? henderson welcome to the show thank you for having me thank so you so happy to have you on i apologize i got on a little bit late you know no, but it, it's all good you know it's quarantine <laughs> so everybody's trying ashley, to actually hit me up like boy <laughs> <laughs> boy is it me or is it you what's up my bad my bad my bad no, so you ashley, ashley so you were you came highly recommended to be on the show so, which I think is pretty cool when somebody says you got to talk to her. So tell me about League 22, man. I want to get into it and, and, and uh, you know, see, hear your elevator pitch and tell me some of the things you, that you've been able to do with League 22. Yeah, my elevator pitch. That's funny. Um, but thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be on here. And I'm like honored to be on here as like the HU move maker. I'm like, I'm you there already. I still feel like I got a lot of work to do. You got it. Uh, to be considered a move maker. But um, you know, I have been able to make a little bit of an impact in, in the in the few years that I've been um, running my company. Um, so I founded League 22 in 2016, um, but I was still technically working corporate. So I was doing events corporately, working for um, Estee Lauder, Mac Cosmetics, um, and who's now my client. Um, and we'll get into that a little well, bit. You later. said you said who cosmetics? Mac cosmetics. Oh, okay. You know, my yeah. sister-in-law, she works for NARS. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, she's an account exec in okay. like four states, man. I, I gotta link y'all up. Yeah, beauty. Like we're we're definitely like I definitely, you know, have a lot of clients in the beauty industry and, and I love beauty events. Um, but um I was with Mac for about three and a half years. And Mac is under Estee Lauder. So Estee Lauder owns oh, okay. like 20 different brands. Um but um, so I started in 2016, was still working full time. So it was kind of like my side hustle. I mean, I've been doing I've been doing events since I graduated in 2011. What, what's a side hustle for folks that don't know? What's a side hustle? A side hustle is really like your passion. That's what, like what you really want to do. Right. So mm. you may have a full time job and that could be, you know, a, a piece of your passion. Um, but your side hustle is something that you really want to do, that you really want to own, um, yourself, that you want to spearhead and lead. Um, and I mean, sometimes it makes you money and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so I always tell people to perfect your side hustle first before you quit your full-time job. No, that's real. That's yeah. real, man. So at what point does it become your full-time job? So it, it became my full-time job in 2018 when I, when I, knew it was time to go like I was getting booked outside of my full-time role uh frequently and I was like okay I can't do both I gotta choose and I kind of planned it though I kind of knew I was like okay I'm gonna give myself one more year and they actually moved I was based in LA doing events in LA on, on the west coast traveling a lot and then they moved me to New York and they were like we want you to do events in New York on the east coast and be in charge of the east the East region. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to do this. And so the back of my head, I already knew I'm going to go to New York, get a new market under my belt, um, get experience, get new contacts, um, and just really get a new city. Um, because I'm from LA and I moved back to LA after Howard. So I was excited to come to New York. Um, but I knew that it, you know, after a year in New York, it was going to be go time. And that's what happened in 2018. I left and I was like, I'm not going to look back, but Oh, did you get like a contract or something like, or did you save up your money? Like what made you like financially? That's a big commitment. Yeah. Financially is definitely a big commitment. So I will say that I definitely started saving before I even went to New York. 
Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I'm gonna give myself a year and um, I'm gonna just start saving because I know I wanna leave. So definitely, definitely, definitely save. That's so important. Save up however many months you feel like you need or will need because being an entrepreneur is not easy. Um, but I also didn't leave until I knew I had potential clients. Um, I will say that I was still, I was working in like building my relationships on the side, um, lucrative relationships on the side while I was still full time. So that's when I knew it was time to go was when okay. I was like, okay, these events on the side can now start paying for my lifestyle. You were doing, were well, you, you were doing events though. Yeah, you know, I was doing for, events. For Mac and, and then you started doing them on your own. So why not just keep doing it for Mac? Um, Mac was only a small piece of my experience. So when I left, when I graduated Howard, I went to work for this company called Hollywood and Highland, which is um, an entertainment center in Los Angeles in the middle of Hollywood. And it has, I don't know if you're familiar, but the Kodak, it used to be the Kodak theater. Now it's the Dolby theater, but it's where they host the Oscars yeah, the yeah. theater where they do all of the movie premieres. So I was doing that. Um, I was, you know, worked my way up. Um, as the office assistant and then went to the assistant director of events. So what's, what's the pay like when you working your way up? I'm going to tell y'all when I graduated Howard, I was making $12 an hour. But on Instagram, it looked like you was balling though. Your, your IG popping. <laughs> my IG doesn't even show my 2011 grad. It doesn't even show that period. I think my, my, I think my Instagram starts in like 2017. I don't okay. even, it shows that. But I will say, that's funny that you say that. But in, 2000, um, in 2011, I was making, I, I moved back to LA and I was making $12 an hour. Man, that's it's tough. Free. That's it's tough. Free. Like what you expect, it's, the school communications, like they don't really set you up for, for success, <laughs> honestly. That's, that's, that's good to know, man. So let's, <laughs> let's rewind a little bit. So now we know that, you know, you get to this point where you're basically calling shots. Now, do you have a team? You have a staff or do you have partners? Um, currently? Yeah. Too, yeah. So I have a small team, small but mighty, um, here in New York, LA, and then in Denver. Mm -hmm. um, so wow, and now one person in Atlanta, actually. So uh, we're trying to spread our wings. We're definitely growing. We're in our growing stages. Uh, we're expanding quickly. We're definitely getting a, a lot of phone calls and referrals, which is amazing. Um, so Have we're just slowed down at all because of COVID. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Damn. Um, let's see. I would say maybe like eight events that we had lined up for the summer were canceled. So we were a little we were a little sad, but you know, we're taking this time to really perfect our processes, our procedures, um, making everything like really simple and easy for our clients to uh, So I mean, what's a typical event like? I mean, I'm sure they're all different, but you know, what's like your sweet spot for an event? Oh, man. So we do so many different events. Um, you know, we do dinner parties. We do influencer trips. Budget. Do what are we talking about budget wise? Brand activations. Okay. So I will say when you get into your brand activations, that's when you're getting, you know, in six figures, right? Damn. You done. So people giving you six figures to put an event together. Absolutely. These brands definitely. Yeah been over six figures it's their marketing budget it's their way of marketing events are are a, an element of marketing so when that's six figures so if i come to you with a hundred grand is your is is your price already built into that and what you're gonna pay yourself or no. That, no so if it, and it also depends on the, on the <laughs> conversation right so you always have a, a consultation with your client and so you you talk through budget you talk through vision you talk through event concept you talk through theme if there is one like you got to talk through a lot of things you know and then we talk about budget and, and what it what that looks like because that's a whole separate topic man um, a lot of people don't really know how much it costs to put on an event people Sometimes in the beginning stages and sometimes even now I'll get phone calls and I'll say people, people will call me and say, I want some, I want an event to look like that. And they send me this picture of this lavish event and they think it's $20,000. And I'm like, try again. Like maybe the venue by itself is 10 K or the venue by itself is 15 K. Damn. Um, so, so if I give you a hundred grand, so if you get a hundred grand for an event, what can you, how many, what can you expect to make off of that? Um, I don't really go into <laughs> all those details, but I will say that standard agency um, 
fee is 20%. 20% of the 100 grand. 20% of of the budget is is typically what agencies that's oh. decent. That's decent. That's, that's not a bad payday, is it? It's not a bad payday, but you also, you got to make sure that you, uh, you got to pay your staff. It's not just you take home that. Oh <laughs> man. That so you probably got a bunch of them $12 an hour folks. You probably was like, Hey y'all come with me. Yeah. I mean, it depends on how you do the budget. If you build in staff on a different line item, it, it really just depends. It, it can vary in different ways. I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you from LA, right? I am born and raised. Born so you and raised. skipped over a lot of cities and states to come to Howard. You know, what made you choose coming to Howard? Um, one, I needed to get away. I needed to get away from um, just kind of like my surroundings. Um, yeah, I just needed to get away. And I wanted to go, I wanted to, go to a good school. So mm-hmm. I did apply to a lot of UCs, which obviously is the University of California school system. Um, but when I got accepted to Howard, I was like, you know what? It's in DC. I think this would be a good experience. I had never been to Howard. I don't even think, did I even know people that went to Howard? I don't even think I knew people that went to Howard because being in California, it was like, we didn't, we thought about HBCUs. Like we talked about Park Atlanta. We talked about Hampton. We talked about these things because we saw it on TV or saw it in movies, but like, it wasn't, it wasn't like a huge deal. Like everybody either went to like USC or UCLA or like one of the Cal State schools. So going out, you know, in a way was definitely a big deal. So when you say you want, you had to get away, was it like a tough environment that you came out of in, in LA? No, it wasn't tough. It wasn't tough. Um, you know, thankfully I had really great parents that really, uh, you know, worked hard to put us in a, in a better position. Um, but I think, you know, some of the decisions that I made probably weren't the best. You got to tell us, it's, it's folks um, watching this that need, that need to learn from your mistakes. You, that's you true. Got, that's true. So okay. what, what happened? Was it fighting? Was you moving so you weight? A filter? Is that what you want? Yeah. I mean, keep, keep it real. <laughs> no, I will say I probably wasn't dating the person that I probably should have been dating. Um, you know, I, I will say good girls lo- love some thugs, don't we? We love a thug, but, um, you know. And so that's, so senior year, you graduate from that school, right? Yeah, so senior year, I graduate, get accepted to Howard, and I'm like, yo, I'm out of here. So what year is that that you come into Howard? I came in in t- 2007. 2007, okay. So you come in Howard 2007. What is it like when you first get to campus like paint the scene for me um wow when I first get to campus um because you ain't know nobody right oh anybody and that and that was actually like not like a realization for me but I realized once I got on campus a lot of the freshmen had already known each other because there was some type of summer program that they all had to do now were you were you pretty popular coming out of high school like were you involved in stuff Oh, you said you ran track. Yeah, I ran track, but I wasn't like, I wouldn't say that I was popular. I wouldn't, mm-hmm. yeah, I wouldn't say that. Just ask <laughs> me, because a lot of people I talked to, they like, yeah, I was president of this and that, and, you know, I was homecoming queen. You know, I'm just trying to get a feel for, like, you know, what you was on when you graduated from uh, from high school. So, okay, so you get to Howard, you don't know anybody. What, what dorm? I stayed in the quad. Ah, the yeah. quad, okay, so no AC. Y'all have AC? No, I don't think we had AC. And I had a bad experience with that. They tried to put me in a in a triple room. Oh, wow. And I was like, this ain't it. This ain't it. Like, I wasn't spoiled, but at the same time, to come from, to come from high school <laughs> and not sharing your own room, and then... You're an only child? No, I'm not. Okay, so let's get to that. I'm not an only <laughs> child. I definitely had to share a room growing up. But then once I got older and we moved, you know, we upgraded a little bit and um, I didn't have to share a room. So I was like, wait, I didn't come from having my own room to, to being in a dorm with three, two other girls. Like I didn't mind doing like the one in one thing, but cause I have a sister. So. No, nah, I, I was in a single. I never had a, I couldn't have oh, a so room. It was, it was good money. So you I didn't even do have it. To experience that. Yeah, I couldn't do it. Yeah, I think it's a little ridiculous. I, I hope it's changed now, but I think it's a little ridiculous to try to put three people, especially for how much you pay in tuition and room and board. I think it's a little ridiculous to put three people in a room. That's just not. Man. Like, so what was it like when you stepped on campus? 
I stepped on campus and a lot of people already knew each other, but I got a chance to meet a lot of people from the East Coast. I thought it was so cool. Most of my friends who I'm friends with now to this day um, were like from the East Coast, from New York, from Philly, um, from DC, from the DMV. So, and it was like, to them, it was like, wait, you came all the way from Cali. So it was definitely like a, um, it was so fun. Um, the campus pals made it fun. I heard you mentioned earlier that you were a campus pal. Campus, campus pals made it fun. Freshman week was fun. Even honestly, too, I will say, um, and I say this all the time, is that when I stepped on Howard's campus, that's when I saw what uh, black elite families looked like because we didn't really see that growing up. Like, you know, I didn't, I didn't have friends whose parents were lawyers or doctors. Like that wasn't a thing for us. Like, even though we didn't grow up in a, in a, in the hood per se, um, or like in a really terrible neighborhood, we grew up in a middle-class neighborhood, but everybody was working class. It wasn't like black doctors and black lawyers and black CEOs and entrepreneurs. So, um, I, I will say that, you know, being on campus and seeing that and hearing that people are like, oh yeah, my parents, you know, they do this. My parents went to Howard and, um, you know, my grandparents went to howard i'm like yeah, yeah that's crazy that's, yeah we hear that's, stuff that's like a, that yeah i remember going to some girl's dorm and um she had a picture of her house but it was like an aerial view i was like that's your house <laughs> you know what i'm saying like that you know, just seeing stuff and you know what's what, what i like about that is everybody comes in on these different you know I guess levels or with these different backgrounds but you get to just make friends with who you make friends with you know you don't come in with an agenda trying to be cool with somebody because you know who their parents are. You really don't find that stuff out until you get to know these people. Yeah. Always love that about Howard. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I was a little intimidated at first though. Yeah. I felt like, yeah, I felt like it, I almost felt like Howard is, is a huge legacy. Right. And, um, and I guess that's the people that I was meeting initially. Um, but then you know, I did, you know, obviously have connections with people that to to me seem more similar backgrounds to, as far as like how we grew up and like, you know, oh, you had to take out student loans to get here. Like my parents weren't paying for my college. They couldn't mm -hmm. afford to put three, three people, kids through college. That just wasn't a thing. Like you get a, you get a scholarship or you get a loan. Like that's what it is. But to, to hear other parents being able to pay their full, their kids full tuition, I thought that was amazing. I was like, Oh, okay. That's the type of, that's what we living in. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was a little intimidated because I did think that a, a lot of people came from legacy or they came from, you know, a really great. So background. you were conscious of that even when you, when you stepped on campus. Yeah, I was definitely conscious of that. And I think it was kind of thrown in my face a little bit. It wasn't something that I was, privy to until I was made aware of it. Wow. Yeah. Man, that's, that's, that's funny you say that. Cause I didn't even, you know, that wasn't my thought process, you know, but looking back, you know, you definitely like, damn, you know, I didn't even peep, you know, that's, that's interesting though. So what are some of the other things that you take a note of, you know, when you come on campus? I mean, you know, for some people, you know, I talked to some, you know, just some girls that are pretty, they like, man, you know, I got to Howard. I thought I was pretty. Everybody was pretty. You know, that was, for me, that was one of the things I was like, damn, everybody is fucking smart. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or every, every girl is, is pretty. Like I remember calling my boys and being like, man, you know, like one thing, you know, when I was in high school, like doing drugs, like smoking weed was like a big, you know, only like the bad, like the real, the bad guy smoke weed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. People drink. But when I got to Howard, it was like, okay, people legitimately smoke weed and got like straight A's, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or kicked it and partied and, and, you know, just seeing that, you know, the diversity amongst black people, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was just so interesting to me. Yeah. I, I actually love that about us. I love that Howard, that we could party hard and we could get good grades mm -hmm. and we up the next morning for class. Like it definitely, um, college was, fun it was a great experience Howard the best experience um I love chapel um I love that they integrated that into the Howard experience um obviously like um the Greek life like I think in I was um, a part of the WHBC radio during Howard so it was just a lot of different things on campus that I felt like um you know really uh 
challenged us, really helped us grow and become the people that we are today. So and I school to see coming in, school to see the whole time. School to see. I was a broadcast journalism major, and then my sophomore year, I trans. I switched to public relations. So coming in, your goal was to what, be in front of the camera? I did. I wanted to be a newscaster. I was like, I'm going to be a news reporter. <laughs> so what, what changed that? Um, I started you was doing good. You had 3.8? Yeah, I had a 3.8. Um, I, was, I started interning. That is where I knew <laughs> <laughs> that I was like. You weren't getting paid. <laughs> it wasn't even about the pay. Actually, I was. I actually had an internship that was paying WHUR radio. Um, they okay. paid us really well, actually, during the summertime. Um, but I will say I interned at Interscope Records, too, in their promotions department. Um, and that's when I knew that I didn't want to be in front of the camera. That's when I knew when I started doing the promotions for the artists and like seeing the inner workings of a label, I was like, Oh, I want to be behind the scenes. I want to be the people that's strategizing and coming up with the events and setting up the events and doing all, all the behind the scenes stuff in entertainment. That's what I really started really loving. And that's when I knew I wanted to be in events. So that internship, that was after your freshman year? That was, yeah, my internship with Interscope was my junior year. Where, and where, where was that? That was in L.A. So I went back home for a summer. Okay. Um, yeah. You, you're on Howard's campus. Now, when you get to campus, are you, like, thinking to yourself, you know, how am I going to establish myself here? Like, are you setting goals for yourself in terms of career? Or, like, socially, are you thinking of organizations that you want to join or take leadership positions in? Um, yeah, I mean... At Howard, I was definitely a part of the Cali Club because I feel like that was like a crew. Like we all the way 3,000 miles away, we got to be tight. So we was definitely cool with all the Cali people. Um, and then my freshman year, my freshman year, it was homecoming. And we went to the Step Show. And it was, was it, what? It was, um some DC stadium auditorium. I forgot the name of it, but it was there. And, um, the armory, maybe it was the armory. That's okay. <laughs> my memory is terrible. Um, DC armory went there as a freshman and I saw, and that was kind of like my first introduction to Greek life, right? Because California is not a huge Greek life state like that's not a thing for us in Cali, even though there are a lot of Greeks in Cali now, but, um, it wasn't a thing for us. And um, so that was like my first real introduction to a step show. And I was like, oh, shit, like this is lit. Like yeah. the way they was stepping and the way they came out and the presence. And I was like, OK, um, but the person, the people or organization, I would say, that really caught my attention was Delta. Um, and I did, was did the like, Deltas win that year. I think they did win that year. I'm pretty sure they won that year. And I was like, who are they? that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. Um, and then I would see them on campus and I was like, yeah, that's it right there. That's a different type. That's, it's, it's just different. Damn. So this is freshman year. You kind yeah, of exposed freshman to that. Year. But at the same time, at the same time, you can't pledge your freshman year, right? So you're introduced to it. Like you're, you know, you get, you get uh, the lay of the land. You see the different, um, orgs that are on campus on the yard. Um, but I started kind of researching and, and asking around and um, shout out to some of my friends, my older friends um, that were at Howard um, that kind of put me on. So yeah. what is that like when you want to be Greek <clears throat> and you know, you're a freshman, are you, who are you reaching out to, to, to try to get, to try to get in the organization? Well, I don't know how it is for everybody because I know some people are legacy. Some people already have Greeks in their family, so they kind of know the process. But mm -hmm. for me, I didn't have that. And I was like, okay, I'm going to start from the bottom and I'm going to figure it out. And I just started reaching out to some of my bigger homies. Like one, Arenze, um, he uh, was at Howard and it was, um, he pledged Kappa. Still a really good friend of mine to this day, but he was definitely one of the people that I was like, okay, yo, what am I supposed to do? Like, you know, it, so people that were kind of, you know, already pledged or, or older than me, um, that's kind of who I looked to. That I felt enough to be, you know, to actually talk about it because it's so secretive and so confidential and you don't want to just tell why, everyone. Why do you think it's so, why is it so such a secret? You know, I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. Like, who started that? Who started that? <laughs> I feel like that was hella petty for them, to, for them to do that. It's like a secret, but not a secret, but 
a yeah, big it's secret. A secret. You know what I'm saying? Because then it's like you see people lining up in in Blackburn, right? Yeah. You see them for the AKAs. You see them for the Cavs, the Alphas. So I don't know. It's not a secret. It's not. But I, I mean, you know, I can't put my finger on it to be honest. So is that intimidating though? To to kind of, you know, because at Howard, everything has a process, no matter what. Everything. You join, but then there are certain organizations, fraternities and sororities that are steeped in, tra- in that tradition. They go back a hundred plus years of this is how you join, this is how you express interest, this is who you need to know, who you need to meet, and how it is political. But as a, I would imagine as a freshman trying to express interest, you know, like what is that, what is that like? I mean, because, it, you know, on one end, they like, well, you know, they always give you that line, well, do your research. <laughs> and yeah. you're like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Do yeah. your research. And then it's like, you don't want to tell an active member, hey, I want to be a Delta. But then you don't want to not tell them. You know what I'm saying? No, you do. You do. You <laughs> express that. You, I mean, it's definitely a process, right? You do your research. Um, but you also, too, because Howard is such a big Greek campus, like you have to think, right? So like if you're applying for a job and it's a thousand people applying for that job, how are you going to stand out, right? Like, how are you going to stand out? Why do you feel like you can contribute or be an asset to this organization or be an asset to this company? Um, So I think that's kind of how you need to look at it. And I think for me, it was important. And I know just being a Delta on campus, what we were looking for, we were looking for women that, um, that, were involved on campus, leaders on campus, um, academically, like you were doing great. Um, that was big, like your grades, because it's like, why do you want to be a part of an extracurricular activity if your grades aren't where they need to be? So your priorities had to be there. Um, I think that's a good, good thing that you're saying. Like what, what, what type of women are these organizations looking for? Um, well, I kind of touched on it. Leadership, yeah. so leaders, um, women who are sisterly, um, women who are advocates for their community, because that's important, um, and not just for the moment, too, right? Um, somebody that really is going to stand up um, for, you know, people that don't really have a voice. Um, and so those are the type of women that these organizations look for. Uh, I know every organization is different. Um, I can only speak to mine. Um, so I think that is, that was what, you know, I aligned with, with Delta. Why, why is it so many women go out for Delta and AKA? <laughs> why is it? You know, every, I will say, I'm gonna say this, just to be fair and across the board, every campus is different, right? So one we'll campus- about Howard though. We'll yeah, we we will say like, okay, so like, <laughs> Delta and Delta, Delta and AKAs. I mean, I I would say to to the outside looking in, probably the most two most popular uh, women organizations, two most popular women so at least at least in at Howard because yeah, I mean, Howard. like you said, you go to other s- schools, it may be the the shoe might be on the other foot exactly. But I re- I just remember being at Howard for probate shows specifically. AK and Deltas, crazy. You know, what yeah. I'm in terms of the sheer number of women that came through the line and alumni that came back to support, you know. And then when you look at, like, you know, like you said, in Blackburn, you in there, you're like, damn, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on in here? Why all these women in here, you know, oh, AK is having a, you know, or Delta's having, and you know, whatever. Um, but why? why do you think, that is because all of these organizations do great work. They do great work, amazing work. And I think it's just, I think it, it could be for a number of reasons for different people, right? It could be their grandmother was a Delta or AKA. It could be a reason that their mother was, or um, it could be a reason that they aligned. They felt like that's the organization they aligned with. Um, or it could also be with the women that were on that campus doing the work um, of Delta or doing the work of another organization, they saw them and they saw them in the community. They saw them on campus and the different type of events and, and, um, community service projects they were hosting. And so I saw that and I was like, you know, it was, it was definitely a difference, right? So you, you, you kind of skew to what you feel, um, aligns with your character, what aligns with what you're, you're currently doing. So, um, yeah. Was it a lot more to it once you 
<laughs> from watching watching them step versus oh. once you got in. Let me tell you something. <laughs> it ain't easy. It ain't easy. It's it like like we saying. It's so hard to be a Delta. That's all. I'm, I'm gonna just leave it at that. <laughs> what what was it like you know when you make line for delta and you notice like maybe and i don't know if this happened to you but maybe like some of your girls that was trying out didn't make it you know what i'm saying maybe one of your study buddies or you know somebody you confided in did that did that happen to you um it did it did majority of the of the um, women that i went out with um made it um thankfully and they're my line sisters today who I love so much. Um, but you know, everybody doesn't make it because everybody can't be chosen, right? Only if you are chosen and you have, like I said, you know, hundreds of girls going out, it, it really is tough to, to pick everybody. You can't like my line was a line of 38. So, um, and I know other lines are different numbers. So I know the AKs had larger lines. I know the Zetas had smaller lines, even the alphas and the Qs. I think the Qs had three people. So like, I, I think it's, I think it's just, um, it, it's, it's just, you have to stand out. You got to figure out a way for them to understand that, you sh that you would be an asset. You contribute to, um, to the work they were already doing. Oh, so what, what other organizations uh, were you involved in at Howard? I was WHBC, part of the Spanish club. The Spanish was my minor. Um, you know, being growing up in LA, Spanish, little Me LA is little Mexico. <laughs> we grew up eating tacos, eating the taco truck. Your, your classmates, one of my best friends in elementary was the Hispanic. Like that's just, yeah. So you, you speak Spanish? Um, I probably write it better than I speak it, but I speak a little bit though. I, and I can understand it a lot more than I speak it. I, I need to practice. Cause Man. I guess. So when did, so you become an AK is it sophomore year? No, Delta, Delta, Delta. Oh, my bad. Delta, sophomore year? <laughs> <laughs> sophomore year. Um, I did the radio station. I was on the news team. So I was the news director for WHBC. Um, so I got a chance to interview a lot of the different artists that would come to Howard's campus. Um, we would do a lot of the music events in the punch out. Um, we brought Pretty Ricky to punch out one year. <laughs> Pretty Ricky, huh? We brought Pretty Ricky to punch out one year. Um, um, I got a chance to interview Nipsey when Nipsey was there. That really? Was, absolutely. That was a huge, huge deal for me because I felt I, we were talking about L.A. and just being connected um, uh, in, you know, in LA so wow so you're doing all of this and you still like I don't want to be in front of the camera yeah but you know what when I was interviewing them radio wasn't in front of the camera so okay um it was definitely I like talking to people I like getting to know people I like people like asking people questions and interviewing people so um yeah that's kind of that was kind of like my my route at, at Howard so would you say like the, the transition from LA to Howard was it pretty seamless or like it was a, a good time yeah it was seamless um we stayed during like christmas i wouldn't go home for christmas thanksgiving i, I went to philly um mm -hmm. one of my close friends he was from philly so we would be in west philly eat philly cheese steaks i loved it because i was like i'm gonna stay it was expensive to fly back to la yeah um so i remember one time i didn't even go home for spring i didn't even go no i, I didn't have a spring break trip trip lined up so i just stayed at, at home at, at yeah. dc i was like i'm not going home <laughs> yeah I didn't want to go home. The one year I went home was to enter was to um, intern at Interscope, and because their office was in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I was I stayed on the East Coast. Well, talk, you know, I mean, tell me, tell me about an L you took. Well, L. When did I take an L? I don't even know when I even. I think um, I, I I didn't allow myself to take L's, right? So like even the first no when they told me that I couldn't be the director of events, like people can consider that as an L, but it was just experience. It was a lesson for me. It was like, now I know how to go in and talk to vice presidents. I'm 24 years old and I'm talking to vice presidents who have 30, 40 years of experience. Right. Mm -hmm. I was always the youngest in the room always. So I positioned myself, um, to know how to, to speak, to know how to operate, to know how to move, um, to know how to just be mature in those situations. Um, so I think for me, that was, learning from me so i never really took an l to be honest damn so there was never any low points any time where you was just like man this is you know more than what i bargained for 
that's that's pretty impre- I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Not really, not really, because I feel like once you start getting into different roles and working for different companies, you start learning and you start knowing how to navigate and maneuver. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, thankfully, I was blessed that I didn't really have to take any L's. So, so, but at this time, in these roles that you're doing, you're enjoying what you're doing. Absolutely, hundred percent. I think I think that takes a big. That's a big part in, not, I, I guess, in saying like I didn't take any L's because when you're enjoying it, even when somebody tells you no, you still enjoying it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that no been like the difference between like, you know, damn, I hate this place. You know, you it probably would have been a harder adjustment for you. Yeah. I think for me, it was important, like I said, to prioritize what I really loved over money and the money. Mm. money Why is that important? Because I I tell the people this all the time, the money will always come. People get so wrapped up in, oh, I need this salary. I need this amount, or I'm not going to move without this amount, or I'm not going to go to this company if they don't offer me this. And I feel like you have to obviously weigh your pros and cons, but like if it's a benefit for you to be in that company and have FaceTime with certain people in that company, that's more valuable to me than a salary. Like mm-hmm. as long as you're able to pay your rent and eat and pay your car note, then I feel like, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you could sacrifice the luxuries in order to get where you need to be. And I think that's the mindset that you need to have moving throughout your career, to be honest. At least that's, that's how I've been able to maintain success. Yeah. Now it's it's such a blessing when you can, when you know what you want to do in life. Period. Because I mean, I kind of went through Howard, just being like, man, I'm just gonna, you know, get a 3.0 is like gonna be where I'm gonna stay at, mm-hmm. and then I'm gonna just graduate. I had no real plan or no real like passion in terms of like when I graduate. It's always been my dream to do X. You know, as a result, I kind of hopped around through jobs and I went back to school again okay. and then luckily I was able, able to open up my you know have my own business that, that did well but you know what I like hearing what you're saying is that you always you know you can only do stuff that you enjoy regardless of what the, what the money was and yeah. I think um you know that's I think that's big so when you get to Mac is there like a budget that you have or a goal that they give you like what are your yeah, our budgets were big. <laughs> we had big budgets. Um, our The goal and objective for our department was um, we were, MAC Cosmetics didn't advertise, right? So you've never seen a MAC commercial, right? I don't think so. So <laughs> Even if I did, I, I, probably, yeah, I probably wouldn't notice. But um, MAC was, I know what MAC is, though. Know right. What. Everybody knows. That's like one of the largest beauty brands in the world. Um, and so it didn't... it we didn't, they didn't advertise. So their form of advertisement was events, uh, was beauty launches, was product launches. And so that's what we were in charge of. Um, so we would identify markets, um, where we felt like, you know, these particular, um, uh, collections, um, would do well in. So we identify markets and that's where we would activate and do events. Wow. So like, what's, what's like the budget for like a typical event for Mac? Um, it, it could range because we had different size of events. We had small events that would happen in store, like in retail stores. And then we had events that would happen inside the malls. So like if you walk in a mall and you see like in their center court, there would be um, an event there. Or sometimes we would do events at different venues. Um, and then we did an event at the American Bank Center Arena in Corpus Christi for the Max Selena event. So that event was over a million dollars. You're over these events yourself? Yeah, so we have a team. It was a team of five of us. Um, team of five of us. We had uh, an executive director. My but what is that like? At, how old are you at that point? I'm, now I'm 25 at this point. At 25, I mean, you putting together events. Yeah. With a, I mean, are those just numbers to you? Or are you realizing, like, damn, this is a lot of money? Yeah, it's a lot of money. But we also, we worked with, like, event budgets that were 50K. We worked with event budgets that were 60K, 100K. Sometimes we had 10K, like if if we just wanted to do small pop-ups inside the store. So like, you know, it wasn't, that's just the event world though. So, well, let me ask you this. So do y'all ever work with like, you know, like a company like, um, you know, like, like your company, um, League 22, are y'all working with companies like League 22 at that point? And you like, yo, these motherfuckers is, 
they cashing out over here. Like, <laughs> you no, know, it's crazy that you say that because yes, we're working with agencies. Most big brands do work with agencies or production agencies um, or companies and yes and no. So like back then when I was working with those agencies, I wasn't like, oh, I need to have this or I need to be that or, oh, they're caking. I definitely thought they were caking because we used to pay them a lot of money. Um, but rightfully so because of fabrication, design, execution, all that takes a lot of money. Um, but I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't thinking about it like that. I probably should have been, but I was actually wasn't. not thinking about the money again. I know that's crazy. Well, that's good though. That's good. I mean, you're, you're having fun. So, you know, so, I mean, when you do a, a million dollar event, is the company looking for like a ROI? Like, are they looking for a certain amount of product to be sold or, or is it just like, Hey, give it away. You know, we just want uh, exposure. No, I mean, it's definitely about exposure, but it's definitely an ROI involved. Um, it's definitely, um, it's behind a collection, right? So we're launching these products and we're selling these products at this event. So we're curating an event um, and curating an experience in order for, in order to make the consumer purchase. Like, I'm going to convince you to buy this product today. Man, it's okay. So you, you obviously you're doing your thing on the side. I mean, and you're, you're getting compensated fairly well from Mac. Is that right? Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> so you quit, right? Well, before I quit, I'm, they moved me to New York. But you so still quit, right? <laughs> Yeah, I still quit, but I, I knew they, when they moved to New York. I mean, to New York, was that a pay increase? It was a pay increase. I had to negotiate that though. They wasn't just giving that up. I'm gonna tell you it was. That. It was the same role. Same role, but actually a bigger title, which is crazy because they didn't want to pay for that title. Um, wow. So they, so you had to negotiate again. So negotiate again. Walk me through this negotiation. Um. So now. Mac has an events department, right? It's two events teams. It's one that sits on the West Coast and one that sits on the East Coast. So we work kind of in silos, like they did all the East Coast events and we did all the West Coast events, um, but we were one team. And so Mac went through a restructure and they got rid of the whole East Coast team. Um, Damn, the whole squad? Whole squad. It was only, I think, five. I think it was 10 of us total. Five on the East Coast, five but on not, the West. But not Ashley. She was untouchable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you got you to gotta work hard to make yourself valuable. So how do you, is, is that something that you're conscious of? Like, yo, like, I'm going to let them know, like, I'm not the one you get rid of. You know what I'm saying? Like, is that something you think about? Um, like, like I didn't want to work, like, being an asset? I think for us, we knew that we weren't necessarily on the chopping block because we, we were producing. So if you have the revenue and the money to back it up, mm -hmm. you can't like, there's no argument there. If you're making the company money, like there's no argument there. So um, yeah, we weren't, we weren't really on the chopping block. So we weren't too worried, but um, I, they did, you know, once they got rid of the East coast team, they said, we need someone to sit in New York. Damn, so, so so Mac, I mean, is this a is Mac a company? Who's the target market for Mac? Um, so Mac has a demographic of women, obviously. And, so we and got women, of course. Then you got now men. Let's go. Let's go color. But in terms of predominantly, who purchases the product? Predominantly women. Women. Ages, I would say, eighteen to upwards fifty. Fifty. All mm -hmm. right. What about ethnicity? Ethnicity. Number one consumer, uh, Latina. Really? Yeah, Latina. I did not know that. I mean, I never bought Mac before, but I did not know that. Yeah, Latina. Um, Is that intentional by Mac, or did that just happen and they ran think, with it? I think it's just the the beauty market. In that, I mean, it's probably change maybe maybe not i don't you know i haven't really been in that role um as of recently so i don't know all the numbers but i know back then that was you know the latina um, market was huge of course african-american of course caucasian asian too asia is huge in beauty that's why hmm. i think were they number two what, what about the the demographic makeup of mac as a company huh I mean, we know what corporations are comprised of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking because a lot of people of color watch this and yeah, 
it, it, it it's not easy to go to if, if you the only one that looks like you. Yeah. To go and ask for a raise. Because yeah. you're like, shit, well, you know, you're not seeing no examples of you excelling in a company like that. Or maybe your experience is different, but. No, that was my experience. I was the only black person on my team, one, and I was the only woman on my team. So um, what made you comfortable? What made you feel like you, Ashley Henderson from L.A., from Pasadena, from Howard, who was getting $12 an hour, who just, they just doubled your pay. And now you want more money. And you black. Why? So now you got a lot of nerve. You got a lot of nerve. I got yeah, I got a lot of nerve, but I also got a lot of work ethic, and I know no one can outwork me, right? So Mac was not a nine to five job. My boss was very much in the office until midnight if he wanted to be on a regular basis. I will say that getting into the beauty industry, I thought it was gonna be a cakewalk, but I actually have so much respect for people that work in the beauty the beauty industry because they work so hard. They're probably one of the hardest working people I know. And granted, I don't know every other industry because I do hear about other people that you know work on Wall Street and how many hours people put in investment banking and all that stuff too. But like, like I will say that we would be in the office for 14 hours and be on the road sometimes two, three weeks out of the month. Like it was a lot. So, um, you know, when your job and your role expects that type of um, time from you, you should expect the same type of pay and compensation for that time. Mm. Um, so I think that is, you know, why when they said, you know, we need someone to sit in New York, I'm like, New York, I'm looking at New York. It has, it's a different, um, cost of living than LA. It's more expensive to live in New York than it is to live in LA. Some people don't think that, but it is true. Very true. Um, and um yeah it was a different cost of living now you've given me the title of north america so now Damn. I'm north, wait 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 what was the title my title before was west just the west region so now no. my title is north america yeah and how old are you and now at this time is so in at mac i was 20 so 2017 i moved to new york so 2017 was that was three years ago so i was 28 damn so I'm so twenty. Title is North America what? So regional event manager North America. Still the same event Damn, manager. That's now heavy. So how long do you stay at Mac? So now I stay at Mac for an additional year in New York. Damn, it's you in these years. You just after well, a year, you like it's time to go. Give me that promotion. You got a year out of me, and I'm out. I'm out. But I was with Mac total three and a half years. That's good for a millennial, cause y'all, y'all stay a place for six months and think you're supposed to be CEO. So when you part ways with them I mean what's what's the attitude like at that point so I part ways with them my boss was so sad he was like don't leave um so I still have a great relationship with them um to this day but the attitude was like yo I'm on to the next like it's your time now like now you really gotta work like you thought you put in 14 16 hour days for Mac it's not, it's not stopping. It's going to be even more. Cause when you work for yourself and you got to put food on your own table, you're not relying on a paycheck every two weeks. It's different. I mean, it's different. All right. So you quit. I mean, walk me through that quitting. Cause it <laughs> like, you just, you, you quit. Did yeah. you have other companies that say, yo, we got, we're going to commit to giving you a contract or, did, or is this just all potential stuff? That, that um, you have in the works. Um, I've seen people quit jobs. Yeah, thinking it's about to be sweet. Like, oh, Josh, you're an entrepreneur. I can do that too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They get out here. People that they thought was gonna come through, don't. You know, yeah. I mean, what what gave you that type of confidence to quit, or was that just a, a gut thing? It was confidence, and it was confidence in my abilities, and it was also confidence in my relationships because the industry is a relationship based. So you, you had, did you have, were you putting bugs out there in people's ear? Like, yo, I'm a, yeah, I'm doing my own thing. Yeah. Was so, your company, but you said your company was making money already. Yeah. Because I founded my company essentially technically in 2016. Oh, um, okay. And so I was still at Mac when I founded my company, when I started my LLC. So, um, we were already making money, well, not a lot, but we were making, we were doing some events um, but I started like, for example, when I was at Mac, 
I was leading the operations for our integration into BeautyCon Festival. And BeautyCon Festival is the largest beauty festival um, in the world. They do, a, you know, their festival in LA, New York, London. And mm -hmm. it, it sucks, but you have to get those those big names under your belt for people to respect your experience, right? Um, and for, for, for you to keep, continue to keep growing and moving up the ladder. Um, I mean, that's key. Uh, so even so at BeautyCon, when I knew I was leaving, I did the last, my last day was the day after BeautyCon Festival. And I told the BeautyCon team, I said, I'm leaving Mac, but I would still love to maintain a relationship with you guys. And they were like, oh my gosh, yes. Like, we love you. We really? love working with you. And they actually hired my company in, what was it, last year? They hired us um, for an event in Miami. Damn, that's nice. Mm -hmm. League 22, right? Yep, League 22. What, what does that name come from? <laughs> it's funny because you're the second person that asked me this. Um, and it's crazy because I don't get that question a lot. You would think I would get it more. Um, I'm, I'm waiting you to say that was my line number. It was my line number. I'm, <laughs> I think I got the 22 on my neck. Yeah, I'm rocking the 22 right now. Um, it's definitely 22 is my line number, but 22 is also a special number um, in Delta because we had 22 founders. Um, of our illustrious organization. Man, a lot so, to remember, a lot to remember. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so 22 founders, so 22 is a special number. You kind of have to strive to be that. Oh, so they probably I, was on your ass then. You know, <laughs> you know, I don't really talk too much about the process, but. Yeah, I don't want you to get no PTSD. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why, why, why leave 22? So 22 was, so I paid homage to my line number. Um, and then I also, so the, the league, it, it was a two, it was a dual meaning, right? So it was paying homage to the first events that I did were for my friends in the league. So that was like, kind of like my first intro outside of college into events outside of my full-time role. Um, and then also league means when I looked it up in the dictionary, it meant like different categories, different leagues, different departments. And so I wanted to do events in different categories. I wanted to be, you know, I, w I wanted to be in my own league too, though. Mm -hmm. um, and That's so funny. that was kind of where league 22 came from. Do you have like a certain amount of months saved up? So you say, man, okay, at least six months I can go without you know, I could support myself without having to scramble for a job for somebody else. Yeah, I definitely saved over a good amount of money. It was definitely, I'm going to just say to any entrepreneurs out there, save, I think people say six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about six to 12 months. So I definitely saved a good amount of money. Um, definitely was dipping into that. But I also got creative too. I got creative and I started doing Airbnb. I got an apartment. I was living in Jersey, but I got an apartment in LA. And I was like, I want to be in LA too, because I was trying to build my event company in LA because I'm from there. And a lot of my clients wanted to do events in LA. So I got an apartment in LA. And while I was living in Jersey, I was Airbnb in my apartment in LA. Yo, you got to tell me, I've been in business for eight years now. And, uh, <laughs> you know, from a freedom standpoint, definitely one of the best decisions I made, but I, I do miss you know, that because, you know, people think that, all oh, you're an entrepreneur, you're the boss, you know, you get, but it's it's stressful. You know what I'm saying? When you got to, when you can't necessarily forecast how much you're going to make, you know, okay, I might, I'm going to have enough to pay my bills or right. at least break even. But a lot of times you like, you don't, you don't even know what you're going to make, you know, and yeah. that's a level of stress that you kind of never get used to, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or even, you know, feeling like you always have to work. You know oh. what I mean? Like, I can't, like, I've been in business eight years. I got a staff, four full-time people. But I still feel like, like, if I take a vacation for, like, more than three days, it's still things that I feel like I neglected or that aren't being handled properly. And I remember yeah. when I worked, when I was a teacher, because I taught for seven years before I did this. I remember like, man, I, I remember I, I miss being able to like take two weeks off, three weeks off and just, just chill. But, but all of that's dead now. Oh yeah. That's you know? dead. There's no vacation. Like how you used to take a vac paid vacation days at your corporate job. That's not, mm -mm. 
I went okay. on a vacation as soon as I quit because I was like, I'm gonna go on this vacation and I'm, it's go time as soon as I land back in the States. And it was go time for me. And I, I had to figure it out. I was lining up. I was spending a lot of time at home because obviously I didn't work in the office anymore. I was spending a lot of time at home, working from my home office, building my, um, my business, building a capabilities deck, um, building my website, the branding of it, what that looked like. Um, and we went through a lot of variations um, of that, of what the company looked like. And so, um, yeah, but then I also started just reaching out to people and I was like, hey, I'm not at Mac anymore. I'm doing my own, I have my own company. So sending a lot of emails, doing a lot of outreach and letting people know that I was on my own now. And so now people are like, oh, okay, well, we're going to use you for this. So we're going to use you for that. So just tapping into my network was key for me. How did you, um, how did you go about building a team? Oh, that was tough. Um, and it's still tough. Okay. Uh, I will say I went about building a team was through referrals and then on via on uh, social media. So I, I put out a filler and was like, yo, looking for event coordinators, looking for event interns, looking for production assistants. Um, and a lot of people sent their resumes in and sent people in and recommended people, but I vetted people and like, I'm on the phone with people. I'm interviewing people because um, I really want people who really want to work hard because I think a lot of times in this event industry to some people can be very glamorous. They see the end result of an event. They see the celebrities that are there at the event. They see the red carpets and they want to take a picture on a red carpet and they don't know what it takes to put together an event. So it was important for me to find people that really wanted to work hard and that were willing to build with me because you're essentially helping me build my dream. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, when you, so when you're, when you're building the team and you're compensating, are you like, yo, I'm going to pay you a percent. Are you paying them based no, on the job right. or flat yeah. fee? How are you paying folks? I was paying people a flat fee. Um, some people, let's say in the beginning, I no, I don't think I ever, did I make anybody work for free? Maybe, you know, I always do a trial period. So I will tell people to like, if they want to work for me, then I'll be like, yo, come on board, do an event and let me see how you work. Let me see your work ethic. Um, and so that also helps me assess. Um, so maybe typically for the beginning, for those events, I probably don't pay them. But even that, I feel like I give them something, but it was always a flat rate um, because I know how it is to be in the event industry and work for free and not make any money. So I didn't want to be also that person that was like, I'm not paying my people because I'm not that type of person. Um, so I'm gonna figure it out and make it work so that I can give you something so that you could at least pay a bill. You know what I'm saying? Our job as a production agency is to, um, conceptualize, to ideate, to strategize, creative design, fabrication and execution. Um, and so, I, it's not necessarily we definitely give recommendations sometimes if our clients our clients usually already have an audience or but you're not having a, you don't have to promote nothing yeah you it's know. not really our job to promote you just got to um, execute it from start yeah to exactly so, but you so could get we give recommendations though on promotion or on strategy on audience strategy well, what is it like competing for for that for business you know being a black woman in an industry that i would I would guess it's probably not dominated by black folks. Cause it's not like they coming to you saying, Hey, we need black consumers. You know what I'm saying? Your skill set is, is literally executing an event and to break into that space, you know, maybe they already got their own people that they already mess with. You know, what, it, how was that competing for business? It's tough. It's challenging. Um, even now, um, I will say to your point, yes, there are not a lot of multicultural agencies or agencies owned by blacks. It's just not, I can count on my hands how many, at least that I know of. Um, and it's not a lot of us that get projects or jobs with large budgets, or it's not a lot of us that get projects or jobs for these larger corporations. Um, because a lot of these larger corporations have larger agencies or creative agencies or marketing agencies or production agencies that they use and they're grandfathered in right they stick with this one agency because that agency knows how they work they know what right. they like they have the relationship with them and that's it they want to, that's who they want to work with and i totally understand and get that um so it is a challenge to break into um you know those larger clients um but gratefully the howard network let's talk about the howard network yeah. um 
the Howard network is real, is real. And a lot of the companies that I've been able to work with, like H&M and Nike, are because of the Howard network. Shout um, out to, to Ezene, right? Shout out to Ezene, yes. <laughs> yes, one of my favorite profites. Um, but um she is head of diversity and inclusion at h&m and she was able to give me an opportunity a chance um Renze is a marketing lead at nike and he was able to take a chance on us um Man. so hey. don't be wrong they don't just take a chance because they know you because right. in the day they have somebody to report to right Right, right. So they're looking at it from the perspective like you got to be good. You actually have to be better than good. You got to be great. Talk about it. Yeah. Talk you about gotta it. Be better what you got to be? <laughs> what you got to be? be? Better than good because they already have these agencies that have the infrastructure that have like years of experience. They can as easily it, as a business owner. You doing? You said you ideating, but look, it's a lot of other shit you're doing too, right? Yeah. You you the accountant. I'm the accountant, CEO, <laughs> I'm the event producer, I'm the assistant, I'm the I'm the runner, I'm everything. I'm running the front door, the back door, the vendors, everything. As a CEO, you do everything. And it's like, you do have to eventually relinquish some of those tasks to your team. So how, um, how long have you been in business? And when I say business, I mean full time. I've only been in business full time for two years. So was it was it worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, Absolutely. It's, it's just the freedom to be able to come up with ideas for your clients, the freedom to be able to work with a lot of different brands. That was one of the reasons why it's not that I didn't like Mac. I love Mac. Mac. I learned so much from Mac. I'm so grateful for the experience that I had at Mac. Um, but it was, it's nothing like being able to work with, um, Nike and YouTube and Beautycon um, and Diageo, like, and to be, and for them to really trust you and to be like, hey, this is the event concept. Can you develop it for us? Can you come back to us with something? Like, that's an amazing feeling in itself. I think that's for me is my high is when I get that initial email because then it's like, oh, y'all want me? Like, so when they, so like, do they have, so do you have to like bid on these things? Sometimes, sometimes it's a bidding process. I'm mean, they call it RFP process, um, which is a request for proposal. And sometimes they'll go out to different agencies. They may for one project, they may go out to three different agencies, and they want to see what those three agencies come back with. And you have to go pitch to them, huh? You have to go pitch to them. Sometimes you have to pitch. Yeah, so you have to create a proposal and say, yeah. yeah. And sometimes you have to create a proposal. And you'll say, this is what I'm thinking for this event. Create. Wow. So you might. So you might spend all this time putting together this proposal yep, and not get it and not get it. Absolutely. Man. So are these, are these proposals where like, you're like on a PowerPoint and you're presenting to like decision makers or do you just email it to them and they look at it? Um, it could be either or a lot of times it'll be, Oh, actually it's either or sometimes I've emailed it and they've reviewed it internally and they get back to us. Mm -hmm. Um, or sometimes you have to get on a call or, um, or your in-person meeting um, and you present your idea to them and we're going through, um, I don't necessarily do my decks through PowerPoint, um, but uh, I usually either have like my graphic designer do it or um, we, we use, uh, what is that, Photoshop and all that. Other oh, so you, so you coming out of pocket just putting these proposals together? Um, depends. It depends. Um, and we also use Canva too. Canva is actually a really great tool. Um, and that's like a monthly subscription. So it depends on who, on who the proposal is for and who's going to be reviewing it. Um, and how extensive it is. Cause sometimes I will say I've been lucky to majority of my, um, majority of the, of the projects that I've, uh, been able to get have, I didn't have to RFP for them. Nice. So you got a strong reputation. Yeah, we have a pretty strong reputation, which is great. What about ideas? Like when you're doing these proposals, how do you protect your ideas? You know what I mean? Like That's if you a great question. Because like, you're like, damn, I don't want to get them the, the the Big Mac with cheese, and then somebody else, you know, they give it to their homie. Like, how do you? Yep. That's a great question. I talk about this with my friends that own agencies all the time because age companies do take your ideas i'm gonna be transparent companies will take your idea and they will execute it try to do it on their own so that they don't have to pay you 
Um, so I, I will say that I, I am very selective on how many ideas I give and who I give it to. But because obviously as an A is my profile and we, you know, like that's just a relationship there. Um, like I wouldn't, I, I can trust sending my ideas to her and I know that they're not going to be, they're not going to shop it around and ex- and try to execute it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, will. they will try to shop it around to a different agency and say, who can do it for the cheapest? So you don't have no recourse if they do that. Cause it's, it's hard to prove, but you, it, it's not hard to prove if you have proof, <laughs> because if you have designs and you see your design and your work out, you know, being executed by another agency. So it's all about how you protect yourself. Do you have an agreement? Do you have an NDA? Do you have like, so like you those, do those things you have NDAs? Those, those are absolutely, those are important pieces wow. um, that you have to implement into your company um, and having legal too. Legal is important. Yeah. So how, how do you scale your business? Cause I know you, I know you got other interests and maybe you want to take some time off and while you taking time off, you still want your company to be making that bread. How do you, how do you scale a business that you're so, I don't know, it's such a fabric of who you are. Yeah, I will say. So now I'm in into the digital space, right? So I've partnered with the digital agency um, in order to scale that way to this digital, because obviously we are a live event production company. Um, and now we know we can't do a live events. So like what's important now is that some of my, one of my clients came to me and was like, I want to do a digital launch. Like I need strategy. I need creative, but like, how can we do this? Um, and so, um, being able to pivot and adjust and really, um, you know, make it work for your clients, um, and make it work for your company. So now I'm able like, but I also know that like, you have to know, what your specialty is. You have to know what you're good at. And so I was able to bring on um, a digital agency to, um, to partner with on this event. I mean, not on this event, on this, uh, well, it was a type, it was like a, a digital launch event. Um, bring on a digital agency, Howard owned, Howard owned, nice. black owned, of course. Um, That's love right there. Definitely good to be able to partner with another Howard um, entrepreneur. Man. So, um, how has uh, COVID affected your business model? Yeah, it's and definitely. I guess the outlook of, of your business. Um, I will say it's definitely affected my business models term in terms of live events. Um, I will say, like I mentioned before, we, we did pivot to digital. So we're working on digital projects now. But right now we're just taking the time to ideate. We're taking the time to strategize. We're taking the time to... Um, fix our processes and procedures that didn't work or that necessarily, you know, weren't the best um, operationally. Um, so that's important to me. My accounting, because um, when you're on the go and moving uh, like a um, hundred miles per minute, you don't really tap into the accounting piece <laughs> and the budget and the accounting and financial piece is huge. Um, so I hired a new tax accountant during COVID, um, business manager. No, taxes have- are real, man. Small as a business taxes. owner, I mean, taxes are real. I remember, I'm not going to say how much I owe, but I owed a significant amount Yeah, about the IRS. And, and when they send you that letter that you owe money, it's not like a pay us any time. It's like, yeah, it's doing about a week. <laughs> like, and, and you, you know, a part of you was scratching your head. Like, how did, okay, I made money, but I didn't make this much money to be owing y'all this, this much. You know what I'm saying? That's an eye opener for a lot of folks. And it's, you start to see why people do go bankrupt who are like celebrities. You're like, yo, how did you go bankrupt? You know, that accounting, it'll, it'll sneak up on you if you're not keeping track of things and writing stuff off and, and you know, and if you don't have a good accountant. Welcome to the Go Fish Village podcast. As a Chinese proverb says, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. At Go Fish, our goal is to teach individuals just like you how to build wealth through real estate. Tell me about a project that you're most proud of or maybe a project that um, you're working on right now that you're proud of, either or. Um, I will say the project that I'm probably most proud of was um, the event that I did for Nike. Um, and that was for the, their BHM campaign, Until We All Win. Um, and that well nike was a dream client for me um so i was like 
I think, did I cry? I might have cried, actually. I actually might have cried. I think when I got the email from Nike that said League 22 was an official Nike vendor, like an official Nike approved vendor in their system, I think I like shed a little tear. Because mm. I was like, wow, like this is really happening, right? Um, and um, we were able to take a idea from you know, a Nike employee and we were able to conceptualize it and we were able to develop it into something a lot bigger because it was supposed to be a small basketball game. Um, and some, he actually sent me an article. It, it made it in an article for, I don't even remember the publication. I need to look at my email, but um, uh, we were, we took this small basketball game idea in order to do a, a game, Ghana versus Nigeria. Um, of course, playing off of, you know, Afrochella, the year of the return in Ghana. Um, the founder of Afrochella was the team captain for the team Ghana. And then uh, TJ Adeshola from, he's the head of sports at Twitter. He was the um, team captain for Nigeria. Um, and then we just created two teams of influencers in their own right um, to do like the battle of the real Jalaf. And I think that was um, what I was most proud of because of, the development and how like we were able to take an idea and go back to Nike and say, this is what we think it should be. And then they were like, Oh, okay, this is great. We weren't thinking this, like we've never done this before. So to be able to say to be for your client, to be able to come back to you and say, yo, this idea is amazing. And we've never done this before. Like to me, that is what makes it all worth it because now I know that my ideas are where they're supposed to be. Um, Mm yeah that's nice that's nice i mean was it was it pressure that you felt when you get a big deal like that absolutely you it's so much pressure because it's pressure to perform right and as i mentioned my contact and relationship was a howard alum so you have to like i you got to be better than great and so it's pressure to perform because you want him to look good in front of his bosses who are probably not black they're white yeah. you know what yeah. i'm saying so, and this is a Black History Month campaign, something that they probably don't connect to. So you have to show them one that like, yes, that you guys can hire black, small black agencies to execute these type of events with over 300 people there. Like, um, so I think that that's the, that was the important piece for me was to really show and prove. It wasn't even about the money again. It wasn't about how much are we gonna make off of Nike. It was like, yo, now we're in Nike system. We're in front of these people. We have they have eyes on us. Let's show and prove. Let's show up. Nice man, nice. So Ashley, so eighteen year old Ashley who's coming into Howard. What advice do you have for her? Mm. What advice do you have for her? Um, number one advice, stay single, don't get a boyfriend. Don't be distracted. <laughs> number one. <by> boys. <laughs> don't be distracted by boys. That's number one. Um, if I had to give 18-year-old Ashley advice, I would have told her to s- switch majors. <laughs> I would have told her to be in school of business. I would have told her to major in marketing. Um, I would have told her to study abroad and get that international experience. Um, I would have told her to... What else would I have told her? I would have told her to start saving as a freshman and stop spending. Wow, saving as a freshman? As a freshman. Because yeah. if you just start saving at 18, because some people are trust fund babies, they start, they get a trust fund or you know a savings account when they, what, 10, eight, five, I don't know. Um, so like some people have that access to that type of cash and capital to mm-hmm. where they can live off of that, right? But like, if I would have started saving at 18, if I knew what I know now and I knew that I was going to be, because at 18, I didn't know I was going to be a CEO. I didn't know I was going to run my own company. I didn't know. I really wanted to be a VP, a president. I wanted to walk into an office every day with a suit on, a white pantsuit, looking like Lisa Ray. Like that was my vision of a boss, right? Like 
So you better you might be happy you didn't go to school to be. You know? Really? Yeah, you probably would have got a, that that corporate job and maybe you could have got complacent. But but you know what? Maybe not because you are the person that you you got to be passionate about it. Yeah. So maybe that probably wouldn't you probably wouldn't have fell in that trap. Yeah. So you know, I definitely would have told her to start saving because I would be in a great place <laughs> now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's really it. I mean, I think you, I mean, yes, you wish you would have, you can go back in time, but I also think it's important to learn from your lessons, right? It's important to learn from experience. Um, and I, and I did appreciate the college experience that I had because um, it's not that I, I wasn't sheltered when I was growing up in high school, but at the same time, I did have strict parents that were very much about education and my academics. And so in eight, when I was 18, I was in DC, I was able to let loose a little bit and, and experience life a little bit more that I, I just had a different experience at Howard. Um, so I appreciated that experience. Yeah, no, for sure. Mm-hmm. What about your legacy? I mean, a hundred years from now, what they said about 22 I mean, I hope that they say that League 22 was the age, the black agency, because I know that's probably the category that we're in, even though that's not the goal. Um, I don't want to be looked at as just a black agency, um, mm-hmm. but I want to be known as the agency who was ran by a black woman and majority black team um, that we broke boundaries. We were able to push these corporations and these companies to hire outside of their normal agency standard, right? Um, that they were able to give, um, you know, this little black girl a chance and that she was able to create and execute um, ideas for them, for their consumer, for the black consumer. Because I will say a lot of the events that we do are for their multicultural consumer, um, which is totally fine. There's an opportunity for that. And Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. Um, I'm aligned with that. I am that. I am their consumer, actually. Um, So I know what their consumer wants. Um, so that's what we want to break boundaries. We want to push boundaries. Um, and I'm going to keep going. I want to change that. I don't want it to just be, um, they continue to hire the same type of agency. Like we can do the same things or even better. Mm, mm. Preach, preach, preach. Somebody wants to get in touch with you. What if they want to work with league 22 or, you know, follow your movement or, you know, need a, somebody to mentor them. I just have questions, period. You know, how, how do they get in touch with you or, or, or follow you? Um, I will say they can email me, Ashley at league22.com. Um, or they can, I'm not big on DMs. People reach out to me via DMs, but I, I usually respond in the DM and just give them my email. Um, but you can follow me, leaguex 22 That's my company's page. Um, or you can follow my personal page, love AMHXO. Um, but yeah, definitely reach out. I'm responsive. I'm not like one of those people that, cause I get that a lot too, is that people feel like they can't reach out to me. And I'm like, definitely one of those people that will talk to you. Uh, biggest lesson that you've learned. Ooh, the biggest lesson I've learned is is um is when you're a boss make sure that you are uh knowledgeable and savvy in the financial field in your accounting field because that's a huge part of running your business and making it profitable good one um you ever had to fire somebody <laughs> I definitely tried. Yes, I actually had to fire one person recently, last year. Well, you fired your accountant. Well, I fired my accountant, yes. He got fired, for sure. But um, but he's external, though. He's not internal. He's not a lead 20. He wasn't a lead 22 employee. Um, but I definitely had to fire someone. And it wasn't necessarily a firing. It was more of just like during the trial period, I, I knew it wasn't going to work. So I just had to let that person know that, you know, just keep going. Cause I never want to discourage anybody from their dream, right? Because they really made dream to be in this event industry. And I also want to be a catalyst for their dream, but I want you to come and learn from me, but I also need you to know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and I need you to take it seriously. So oh, yeah. um, if you don't, don't do that and you show me that you're not taking it seriously, it's just, it's not, the relationship is not going to work. A hundred percent agree. Last one. Um, start one, bench one, cut one. Trade shows, pop-ups, corporate events. Yo, you're literally on my website right now. <laughs> I'm not, man. I'm not on your website. I just, I studied you. Oh, you really? Is that what... It's called doing your research. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Hey, do that research. Can I, can I get an Emmy? Damn. And not have enemies? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said trade shows, pop-ups, and what was in corporate events. Mm -hmm. I would, um, I would cut trade shows. I would... Uh, pop-up events, I would start at pop-up events and I would bench corporate events. Dope. Dope, man. Ashley, yo, you've been a great guest. I feel like I connected with you, got to know you. I man, know I feel like I took my whole story. life. <laughs> Thank you for joining the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www dot hu movemakers dot com. <laughs>